I'm a huge fan of Tony Braxton's 90s hit R&B single, Unbreak My Heart. One of the many reasons I love it is its unique use of morphology. The chorus of the song goes, Unbreak my heart. Say you'll love me again. Undo this hurt you caused when you walked out the door and walked out of my life. Uncry these tears. And so on. You should really give it a listen. Now, neither unbreak nor uncry are official English words. They were invented by the songwriter Diane Warren. They don't violate any morphological constraints per se. The prefix un can attach to verbs but they do violate semantic constraints. The prefix un means to do the reverse of an action. Just as you can't uncrack an egg, you can't unbreak a heart or uncry tears. So why aren't the lyrics repair my heart or dry these tears? Well, the easy answer is because Diane Warren is a better songwriter than that. But these are inspired lyrical choices precisely because the idea of reversing an action is encoded morphologically in the word, and because the resulting word is semantically impossible. When we hear Unbreak My Heart and Uncry These Tears, we understand exactly what the singer wants, and we feel the impossibility and desperation of her situation. It's a beautiful and melancholy example of how artists can harness the power of linguistic structure to elegantly convey meaning and emotion. In this video, we're talking about derivation, the aspect of morphology that made Unbreak My Heart possible. First, a quick review. In inflectional morphology, we talked about how a lemma undergoes inflection to create forms in a lexeme. Each inflected form in the lexeme carries unique grammatical information. For example, the lexeme of the lemma teach contains the third person singular form teaches, the past tense and past participle form taught, the continuous aspect form teaching, and the form teach, which is present tense, first person singular and plural, second person singular and plural, and third person plural form. While inflectional morphology is the process of creating and recognizing forms within a lexeme, derivational morphology involves creating new lexemes. This means that derivational morphology results in words whose semantic meaning differs so substantially from the base they are considered a new lemma. Teacher, for instance, would not be considered an inflected form of teach. It would be the lemma in a new lexeme, containing the singular form teacher and the plural form teachers. This is because the suffix er added considerable semantic information i.e. a person who teaches, and change the syntactic category, that is, from a verb, teach, to a noun, teacher. Keep in mind that derivation doesn't necessarily change the syntactic category of the base. For instance, reteach means to teach something again, but it is still a verb, just like its base, teach. So just remember that inflection adds grammatical information, and derivation always changes the semantic meaning of the base, and often changes the syntactic category as well. In derivational morphology, there are a lot of constraints regarding the category of words that affixes can attach to. In previous videos, we talked about how the prefix un cannot attach to a noun, and how the suffix if I can only attach to nouns. Our implicit understanding of these rules helps us to recognize new forms. This can be tricky for language learners. To illustrate this, do you know this word? Squally? What do you think its syntactic category is? A noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb? You probably know that it isn't a noun and it isn't a verb but you might be stuck on whether it's an adjective or an adverb. The safest guess would probably be that it's an adverb, given the ly suffix. However, in this case, it isn't. It's an adjective. The trick is that not all words ending with the ly suffix in English are adverbs. Most are, but in some cases they're adjectives. The rule is really simple. A noun plus ly results in an adjective, as in lovely, godly, manly, or squally. 
An adjective plus ly results in an adverb, as in quickly, slowly, or ingeniously. These kinds of distinctions can be very tricky for language learners, who may lack the necessary vocabulary to parse the word. In this case, if you didn't know the syntactic category of the root squall, meaning a violent storm, then you wouldn't have been able to differentiate between the two functions of the suffix ly. Hence, you may have had difficulty telling whether it's an adjective or an adverb. We can run into the same trouble with ing, which can function as an inflectional suffix encoding aspect, as in, I'm running right now, or a derivational suffix that attaches to a verb to form a noun, as in, I love running. The derived form has a special grammatical term that sometimes comes up called the gerund. Language learners often have difficulty with this distinction, mostly because both forms are introduced quite early in ESL curriculums. Luckily for learners, English derivational affixes tend to form single predictable patterns. Typically, derivational affixes can only attach to words of a specific syntactic category, and the resulting derived forms belong to a single syntactic category as well. Here are some examples. These derivational affixes result in the formation of a noun. This is also called nominalization. The affix ness can attach to an adjective to form a noun, as in kindness, greatness, or quickness. The affix iti can also attach to an adjective to form a noun, as in rigidity, complexity, humidity. And ion, or shun, can attach to a verb to create a noun, as in participation and complication. The affix al can attach to a noun to form an adjective, as in national or professional. The affix ish can attach to a noun to create an adjective as well, as in boyish, girlish, or childish. The affix ify can attach to a noun to create a verb, as in glorify or fortify. And the affix is or ize can attach to a noun to create a verb, as in terrorize or memorize. These derivational patterns are quite easy to remember as long as you're comfortable recognizing syntactic categories and are able to keep some archetypal examples in mind. The patterns that are easiest to remember are those for affixes that are very productive. This means that there are many derived forms that contain that affix. When you think about productivity, it's easiest to think about it in terms of coming up with examples. If you find it easy to come up with many examples for a given affix, then it is likely more productive. The productivity of an affix similarly predicts the likelihood that an affix will be used in new derived forms that appear in the language. The distinction between a derived form and a root lemma can often be difficult to distinguish. Let's look at these three prefixes, re, in, and d. Re as in recharge, or to do something again, in as in independent, the opposite, and d as in deactivate, again, to do the opposite. But what is going on in these three words? Reject, inject, and deject. Or similarly, reflect, inflect, and deflect. Are these words roots, or are they derived forms? If they're roots, we shouldn't be able to break them down into more than one morpheme. We can see in them the morphemes re, in, and de. However, when we take away these three prefixes, we're left with ject and flect. Now, ject and flect are not real English words that we could recognize. Do these patterns emerge from somewhere, or are they the product of chance? There are two ways of thinking about this. If we consider the word's origin, or its etymology, then we can determine that these words are, in fact, morphologically complex, i.e. they contain more than one morpheme, they are a derived form and not a root. In the case of reject, inject, and deject, ject is derived from the Latin gesir, or to throw. So reject means to throw back, inject means to throw into, and deject means to throw away from. Once we recognize ject as a word that carries some kind of meaning, then it's easy for us to see that these are three derived forms. The same is true for flect, in reflect, inflect, and deflect, which is derived from the Latin flectir, or to bend. So reflect means to bend back. 
inflect means to bend inwards or into, and deflect means to bend away from. Remember from an earlier video the term bound, as in a bound morpheme. In this case, ject and flect could be considered bound bases or bound roots, i.e. they're roots or bases that can only appear within a derived form. In that sense, these words are morphologically complex. However, there's another way of thinking about this, where these words would be considered morphologically simple, and that is from a psychological perspective. If we think of morphology as a description of what our minds do when we make and understand language, then whether words like reflect, inflect, and deflect are morphologically complex depends on the knowledge that the language user has. If you don't know that flect is derived from the Latin flectir, then the way that you process these words will be much more similar to the way that you process other morphologically simple words compared to ones that are morphologically complex. It's worth considering these kind of perspectives because, after all, language does begin and end in our mind. An important aspect of derivational morphology is how it interacts with phonology, or the way that words are pronounced. The attachment of a derivational affix often results in what's called phonological change, or a change in the way that the root is pronounced. For example, a derivational affix can shift the syllable stress pattern of the root, the root titan has stress on the first syllable. However, when the suffix ic or ic is added, the stress shifts to the second syllable, as in titanic. Derivation can also lead to vocalic change, or a change in the vowel sound in the root. When the suffix al, or al, is added to the root nation to create national, the a sound in nation shifts to an a sound in national. Derivation can also lead to the pronunciation of silent letters. Take the example paradigm, in which the G in the root is silent. However, in the adjectival derived form, paradigmatic, the D is no longer silent. One of the more peculiar aspects of English derivational morphology is called zero derivation or zero affixation. That is, derived forms that do not differ in their orthography, meaning their written form, but differ in their syntactic category. In fact, the majority of short nouns in English undergo zero affixation to become verbs. Take these examples, a message, or to message someone, a text, or to text someone, a phone, or to phone someone. You can tell how incredibly productive this derivational pattern is by how quickly the zero affixed forms appear following the first usage of the root. Immediately after the noun text was coined to refer to a text message, the verb to text someone followed immediately after. Interestingly, there is also a small subset of words in English that undergo phonological change as the result of zero affixation. These are roots such as the verb to record, with stress on the second syllable, and the noun record, with stress on the first syllable. In these cases, the question of which form is the root is determined by which word appeared in the language first. However, again considering that morphology is simply a description of a psychological process, it's uncertain whether etymology makes a critical difference. From this perspective, the root of a zero-derived form would be the one we encounter first at an earlier age, or possibly the one that we see more often, or that has higher frequency. In this video, we learned that derivational morphology involves the addition of semantic information, and often a change in the syntactic category of the base. This results in the formation of new lexemes, which can include their own inflected forms. We learned that there are constraints regarding the syntactic category of the root and base that an affix can attach to, and that the attachment of certain derivational affixes result in derived forms with specific syntactic categories. We also learned that derivation can lead to phonological change in the root, and that sometimes derivation can occur without any overt changes to the root at all, as is the case in zero derivation or affixation. If you have any questions or requests, put them in the comments. If not, thank you for watching, and go listen to Tony Braxton's Unbreak My Heart. You won't regret it.